Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to dive into a philosophical meditation on the dangers of allowing our political landscape to develop into a three-party system. In this case, under the context of that third party determining that there were insufficient resources to provide the level of care necessary for a functional society. Given this, and under the guise that purging one's deep-seated emotional turmoil is a necessary aspect of human nature, the concept of the purge was born. But is it helpful? And and is it actually healthy? In order to look forward, we first have to go back to the beginning and see how it all started with the first purge. In the process of parsing this information, please don't let me prevent you from hitting the like button if you see or hear something you like, nor from leaving a comment identifying your favorite film from the purge series. Let's get to it. We open on an interview with a colorful gentleman who openly acknowledges his need for the pipe. If he doesn't get it, he becomes unrepentantly violent. While some may struggle with this aspect of their personality, Skeletor recognizes this is just part of who he is. He has to purge. Purge. Interesting term. We then listen in on a newsreel that describes essentially the world as it is right now. Widespread unrest has led to the emergence of a dreaded third political party, this one named the New Founding Fathers. This group has, through promises of revitalization, managed to rise to power. We then transition to Staten Island, somewhere in New England, where we meet Dimitri, the neighborhood boss getting in his cardio while learning about this new purge situation, which is to be tested for the first time on Staten Island. We also meet Naya and Isaiah doing the best they can with what they have and trying to ignore the upcoming event that looms over them, perhaps like a leaky pipe about to burst? We're then invited into another confidential interview where we learn the NFFA, the governing body overseeing this experiment, is paying residents $5,000 to stay on the island. In addition, they're offering monetary bonuses for engaging in and instigating purge activities. As the news reports on the growing anticipation, most of the normies are working to get off the island. Amidst the protests against this barbaric experiment, the NFFA chief of staff confirms that this is a vetted and voted upon project, so it's pretty legit. Dr. Updale, the project's conceiver, also confirms that it is apolitical. Its purpose is therapeutic and should help to heal the growing rifts in our society. Dimitri then descends from his ivory tower to take in the ambiance, pay tribute to those he calls the three kings of the neighborhood, and confide in Naya that, despite being an unsavory fellow, he's not into this type of unbridled destruction. Meanwhile, on a nearby corner, we see Isaiah training up for his new job, to the disapproving clucks of the old timers. He gets his first test from Skeletor, who tries to convince him that it's customary for new slangers to hook up their good customers with a free sample. Isaiah's response is not customer service oriented, so Skelly sprays him with some COVID before slicing his neck and running off. We then transition to Dimitri holding a town hall for his employees, where he encourages them to lay low and avoid getting hurt. The goal here is to prevent profit loss or the creation of an opportunistic opening for their enemies. They've deemed it too risky to try to move the stuff or the money off the island. After a little bit of power checking, they're feeling pretty confident that they have everything squared away, with very limited likelihood that they'll ultimately reap what they sow. When we see Isaiah again, he's addressing his fresh neck wound. However, he didn't do enough to stem the flow before laying down a scarlet trail for Naya to follow. She's disheartened to learn that he's been running the streets for D. As we transition over to the local sports club where the boys are getting in a few last hoops before the murder spree start up, we discover that D is also an active coach and mentor to many young men. Naya busts in and expresses her dissatisfaction in Isaiah's career aspirations, which Dimitri claims to be ignorant of, but he vows to balance the scales of justice here. Recognizing this as code for violent retribution, Naya admonishes her former lover for the man he's become. Still thirsty for that filthy Luca, Isaiah takes his first free moment to visit a purge trailer, where he receives his complimentary flower and recording lenses. An hour before the purge starts, we see that not everyone who wanted to leave was able to do so, while others seem perfectly happy to just be right in the middle of it all. Meanwhile, those who agreed to stay for the money but had no intention of participating find comfort and safety in numbers. Naya finishes checking in some of the refugees before circling back with Isaiah, who lies about being in Brooklyn 
Brooklyn. Instead, he pops in his new contacts, which would only work if you don't already wear contacts, and then hits the streets to find Skeletor. As the sun goes down, everyone settles in for the festivities. After some well wishes from our overlords, the official warning announcement is broadcast. As the siren blares, Isaiah emerges into the night air, where some folks are already reveling in the party atmosphere. Elsewhere, Skeletor takes a moment to admire his murderous preparations, and we learn that social mores were apparently the only thing keeping him as close to within the lines as he had been. Eager to get that money, he hits the streets and manages to draw first blood. This is confirmed at the command post, where an air of titillation runs through the crowd. Dimitri Dimitri takes some time to check in with his business partners and former lovers, but Nia is tied up at the church in her own mini perch when she finds Dolores ransacked the pastor's office to dip into his private stash. Out in town, Isaiah proceeds through an alley where he wonders if he may be a sheep among wolves. He then turns a corner where he finds those two ladies from before had apparently raided the local radio shack in order to fashion some remote detonators. He makes it through their gauntlet and comes out in the business square, where the town proprietors try in vain to protect their storefronts. He then runs across a group of school chums who convince him to join them at a purge party, where they intend to leave this nastiness behind them and just dance. This is bad news at the command post, where they observe parties unfolding all over town. I mean, how will the people heal their broken individual psyches if they don't engage in collective acts of violence? This moment is interrupted, however, when news of the first murder of the evening begins to disseminate to various groups. Isaiah takes this as his cue to head out to find his target, but his target has arrived, and he is delighted at the opportunities before him. Back at Dimitri's penthouse, his assistant delivers him some ready and willing ladies, who immediately begin to put on a show for daddy. After some concurrent grinding at both locations, everyone starts to get aggressively stabby. The two femme fatales employ their best moves, while the party goers discover how disruptive murder is toward experiencing joy. Once neutralized, the ladies immediately identify their employer to be Capital A, one of Dimitri's employees. Employees. Updale considers this a fairly good starting point, even though the news reports out that it's generally quiet out there. Isaiah contributes to the quietude when he struggles to do the one thing he set out to accomplish that evening, and finds himself scurrying around looking for a dangerous place to hide. Despite the open legality of everything, the crackheads are still enjoying their drugs underground, and do not appreciate Isaiah's intrusion. Recognizing he's now in too deep, Isaiah finds a quiet spot and comes clean to Naya, dragging her out into the open. She suffers the misfortune of running across a baby-faced crotch grabber who, we presume, has been waiting under a grate all night, hoping an attractive woman would come check out this one dumpster. So anyway, she arrives at the spot and waits outside for Isaiah to come to her. The perfect plan. He removes his contacts to avoid detection and then emerges, just in time to stab Skeletor in the back with a large shard of glass. Elsewhere, Capital A rolls up to the ladies and, in his celebratory mood, basically admits to everything out loud thinking this is now his time to wear the crown. This prompts D to spring his trap, where we also learn, I don't know how to die. He has an unusual talent to help carry him through. Then as he walks away slowly, some purging happens. While it feels like things are ramping up, we learn at the command post that there's some anxiety around the relatively low levels of participation in comparison to expectations. Naya and Isaiah are heading back toward the church and discussing the best pathway toward success and lifelong enrichment. They come to an agreement, but the good times are ruined when a succubus pops out and puts him up against the wall. Luckily, he's just a mischievous devil out to have some fun, the little stinker, but he's followed by a true danger as a gang of Caucasoid dirt bikers roll through ahead of a very professional-looking death caravan. This development is coincidentally expanded upon when a news story notes an unexpected development in human behavioral research. A high percentage of participants on the ground are wearing masks to hide their identity. On the way back to his penthouse, Dee is then involved in a major car accident. He wakes up to a full-on gun battle underway. He momentarily turns into John Wick before calling in his location for some backup. When they arrive, it's noted the dead gentlemen have matching tattoos that indicate military background, and they're identified as mercenaries. Meanwhile, Naya and Isaiah arrive at the church just in time to see the end stage of a massacre underway. They find a couple of survivors, but nearby gunfire prevents them from sticking around to find anyone else, so they head back to their apartment. At the command post, it's noted that a slow start with a sudden spike in violence is the inverse of expectations. 
Suspicious about this outcome, since it couldn't have been her hypothesis, Updale requests the camera tech backtrack the CCTV to ascertain where the caravan originated. It turns out, a large number of vehicles came spewing from a central garage location and then immediately converged on various highly populated areas around the city. When confronted with this info, Sabian comes right out and admits that this was all an attempt to cull the population to make it easier to manage reasonable solutions to most of our social ills. And now, for the first time since grad school, Updale reconsiders her pursuit of the social sciences. Back at the accident site, now with an earpiece in hand, Dee and his group decide to track the mercs and use their talent for violence to save the community. First, they head back to the armory to pick all their personal favorites before hitting the streets to mount a counterforce. As they do that, our survivors run the streets with violence unfolding all around them, eventually arriving at their building. They just barely make it in unscathed, but are home now, and there's only two hours of purging left. Despite this, the state of things is almost overwhelming, but then Dolores arrives and brings some much needed levity in these trying times. Dee's team hears about some locals who are pinned down and putting up a resistance, and we see it's the three kings fighting off a gang of clansmen. Unfortunately, they are out-equipped as they run out of ammunition in success session, requiring them to transition to melee weapons. But before the clan can make a move, some smoke grenades fog up the joint and provide the perfect cover for the wrecking crew to slip in unseen and just absolutely destroy their enemies. Unfortunately, there's no time to celebrate as the radio indicates that all units are now converging on Park Hill. They make it there quickly, but while planning a strategy, a gang of drones takes out the whole group leaving Dimitri lonely while also confirming he does indeed not know how to die. As the militia moves into the building, Naya encourages them to arm themselves, and Dee calls her to confirm that he's going to make his way up from behind them. He approaches the first active floor where the team is already winning hallway battles and busting down doors. As a warm-up, a couple of blokes happen into the stairwell with Dee, where he helps them recognize the mistakes they've made in life that have led them here. He then gets the idea to take out the lights. This turns the advantage in his favor, and he's able to quietly take out an entire unit, other than the captain, who then calls in for a replenishment of manpower. Up ahead at the apartment, Naya comes up with a plan for the attackers, use their five bullets to shoot low and then come in for the kill once incapacitated. They wait for the inevitable confrontation, and the plan goes off sans hitch, with Isaiah even showing that he's starting to get his stabbing legs under him. Dee then arrives to take out their backup. Unfortunately, their reinforcements show up quickly and pin them down. While he's scoping the corner with a mirror, they get a lucky break, because right when they're about to let loose with the rocket, Skeletor arrives and is disappointed to discover that the NFFA hired outside contractors to do his job. He files his complaint with the manager, giving D time to toss out his C4 charge and shoot it, roasting alive anyone who wasn't already dead. As the sun comes up outside, the sirens signaling the end of Purge Night sound off. The survivors of Park Hill emerge with a renewed optimism. Now, we fight. And we're left to assume that everything just got better from there. It feels good to now fully know why we have a purge, and that it at least started from a place of good intentions. If only Dr. Updale's peer and therapeutic vision hadn't been so twisted and bastardized by the dirty business of politics, imagine how well off our society would be now. In watching this one, I think it makes sense that purge activities seem to revolve around murdering people you don't like. If you know people are going to be out murdering, then the ultimate stakes for going out would be to wind up dead. So why would you go out unless you really had a murderous itch you needed to scratch? You'd think you're going out to have fun raiding a candy store or scoring 15 copies of Madden 21 only to wind up dead. Aside from that, the Purge series has had political implications from the start, but I'm not sure that these themes were provided additional depth by making it all tie back specifically to governmental attempts at population control. To me, it seems a bit more heavy-handed than it needed to be, but what do you think? The series box office went up with each successive installment. Do you think the series holds up well across the board? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've seen the newest movie, I'd love to hear how you think it rates in comparison to the others. And before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.